Samuel 24, verses 1 through 17. Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go, number Israel and Judah. And so the king said to Joab, the commander of the army, who was with him, Go through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, and number the people, that I may know the number of the people. But Joab said to the king, May the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times as many as they are, while the eyes of my lord the king still see it. But why does my lord the king delight in this thing? But the king's word prevailed against Joab and the commanders of the army. And so Joab and the commanders of the army went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. And they crossed the Jordan and began from Aror, and from the city that is in the middle of the valley towards Gad on to Jazer. And they came to Gilead and to Kadesh and the land of the Hittites, and they came to Dan, and from Dan they went around to Sidon and came to the fortress of Tyre and to all the cities of the Hivites, the Canaanites. And they went out to the Negev of Judah at Beersheba. And so when they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and twenty days. And Joab gave the sum of the numbering of the people to the king. In Israel there were 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000. But David's heart struck him after he had numbered the people. And David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, O Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. And when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, Thus says the Lord, Three things I offer you. Choose one of them, that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him and said to him, Shall three years of famine come to you in your land? Or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days of pestilence in your land? Now consider and decide what answer I shall return to him who sent me. And David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But let me not fall into the hand of man. And so the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from the morning until the appointed time. And there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba 70,000 men. Stretched out his hand towards Jerusalem to destroy it. The Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, It is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. And then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Behold, I have sinned and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray uh, even this morning that it would shape our thoughts, our actions, and our words. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this this is our second in our series, Presbyterians in the Park. Uh, could last a few weeks, a few months, a few years. Who knows how long this will last, but uh, this is our series in the park. And then last week we covered um, the story of, of David and some of his warriors. And now we're getting to the end of David's reign and some final thoughts on David. And this is a challenging chapter, a very challenging chapter. And so we're going to take a couple weeks to kind of get through it. And there's a lot of things happening in this chapter. We'll only get to some of it. But let's just look uh, first at verse 1. It begins with a perplexing issue. It says, the anger of the Lord was burning against David and against Israel. God was going to punish his people. So anytime you read that as, as a member of the church, as a person, a people of God, why is God upset? Why is he angry? Why is he wrathful? Why is he upset? And the honest answer is we don't really know. There's a few good guesses on why he might have been upset. Uh, It could have been that when David took this census, which was done for military purposes, it could have been that David did it with a proud, arrogant spirit to say, look at at what I've done. I've got a pretty good group here. I've got a large number here. That that could have been why his attitude might have been wrong. It might have been, secondly, it might have been that David was making the census and was planning on additional wars and battles to expand the borders of Israel beyond what God had told him. It could have been he was planning on more battles. We, we don't know. That, that's a possibility. Uh, it might have been that David was including men under the age of 20. At age 20, you were in the army. And it could have been that David was also trying to see, how many guys do I have under 20 for down the road for more fights? The last option, and this one, this one kind of makes sense. If you read Exodus 30, uh, you know, Moses, you got Sinai, the people of God, they're in the wilderness. And God tells Moses in Exodus 30, he says, when you take a census of all the military men of fighting age, there's a half shekel tax that they have to pay, a ransom tax or an atonement tax. And that money goes to the Lord. It actually actually goes to a building fund, the sanctuary fund, the the tabernacle fund that they had under 
under Moses, which is kind of funny. It could be that David didn't charge him the half shekel. Because if you read Exodus chapter 30, God says, if you don't charge him that, there's going to be a plague. So it could have been that David wasn't following the Torah, the law of God. Something he did was not following God's instruction, or his attitude was not appropriate in doing it. And so God is upset. We don't know really the reason, but God is upset uh, that there was some violation of the law of Moses. We know that because it says God's angry, but we also know from Joab's response. We saw that in the first few verses. You guys remember Joab? Yeah. This guy had no conscience. I mean, he killed Abner, who was Saul's military general. Remember, he brought him, brought him to the gate and said, hey, I got a conversation, stabbed him in the stomach. Remember that? And then when Absalom was in control, David said, hey, whatever you do, don't kill Absalom. And Joab said, oh, yeah, I got it. No big, yeah, we got it. They found Absalom. What did Joab do? He's like, I got it. I got it. I'm going to kill him. This guy has no conscience. He kills everybody, and yet he tells David, we shouldn't be doing this. He has a conscience on this. So something David was doing was clearly wrong to where even Joab says, this isn't right. God's upset. Joab's upset. Something's not working. But David looks to Joab and says, thanks for your input, Joab, but I didn't hire you to give me input. This isn't a democracy. This isn't a republic. I'm the king. Do your job. And so Joab has to do his job. And so Joab leaves, and if you were to take a map, the map in the back of your hard copy of God's word and look at what he does. They, they go north and then they go counterclockwise into all the tribes, into all the, the region that was governed by David. They go into all the areas and it takes them about 285 days for that trip north all the way down to Beersheba. Starting in Dan in the north all the way down to Beersheba. It takes them about 285 days and they probably did this after the fighting season ended in the summer. So probably in the fall they started this and it went into the spring of the next year. And it says there were 800,000 men to fight, 500,000 in Judah. And there you kind of get a glimpse that there's going to be a split down the road. And that will happen after Solomon dies, when the Israel splits into the northern kingdom, which will be called Israel, and the southern kingdom, which will be called Judah, the tribe of Judah. Um, so there's going to be a split down the road. You see a little bit of that indication here. But something's wrong with this, and, and David realizes it finally, and he repents. David repents. It says the prophet Gad was sent to David. And the prophet Gad, we, we haven't seen much of him, but he's been around forever. He was there when Samuel was the prophet. It's kind of like Batman and Robin. Samuel was Batman, Gad's kind of like Robin. So when Saul was persecuting David and had David on the run, Gad came to David and said, David, you need to go to Judah and camp out in Judah. So Gad's been around for a while. We just haven't heard much from him. Now he shows up and he says, David, you've sinned. Here are your three options for punishment. He says, you got years of famine, months on the run, or days of, of plague. I mean, what would you choose? What would you rather have? What would you rather have? Years of famine, months on the run, days of plague. Days of plague. Days of plague. There you go, Renell. Renell opts for days of plague. Thank you, Renell. But do you see the pattern here? The longer the punishment, the less severe. The shorter the punishment, the more severe. So the longer the punishment, the famine, you can get through a famine, but it's just going to take a long time. All right? The shorter one is when people are going to die, when it's going to be just a few days. That's the pattern. And the outcome is about 70,000 people die. 70,000 people. I mean, think about that number. I mean, that, that's like taking Somerville off the map and part of Goose Creek. <laughs> that's like taking Somerville off the map and part of Goose Creek, 70,000 people. Um, you know, we're, we're dealing with the coronavirus situation, and we're, you know, thinking about that, and I think the last count, there were a few thousand people died, which is sad. In South Carolina, there's 15 people, uh, which, which is sad and unfortunate. Here, 70,000 people die, and it shows that God is angry at sin. God is wrathful at sin, that our, if we commit sin, there are consequences for our actions when we commit sin, when we go against God's word. And here, the, the first point is sin brings about God's wrath. It brings about judgment because we break God's law. We reject God's word and we say, God said to do this and I think I'll just do this. God said this, I'll go this direction. And that brings punishment because as we sang you know, just a few moments ago, God is holy. He is without sin. He's perfect. He's above his creation, his creatures. He can't tolerate sin. So it brings wrath and punishment because he's just, he's holy, he's perfect. And that was true for David and true for us that when you and I sin, when we say something to someone we shouldn't say, and we do something we shouldn't do, it dishonors God. It makes God upset because he expects that we should act like him, that we should love God and love our neighbor. Mark chapter 12, love our neighbor as ourselves, just as we love the Lord. And so here we see that sin brings about God's punishment.
punishment brings about God's wrath. And it shows us that God isn't tolerant of sin. And that, that's really not a popular thing to say in, in our culture. It's not a popular thing to say in America or in the West. But God punishes sin. He doesn't tolerate. He doesn't look the other way and say, well, he'll do some other good stuff this week. I'll just look the other way. No, God punishes sin. He, he is serious about sin. He treats sin as an attack on him because it is just a rejection of his law, of his character. And God takes it so seriously. What is he going to do? He's going to send his son to die, to take on that wrath. He's going to send his son to die on the cross. That's the heart of the gospel, that God is upset with sin and he's going to punish sin. But instead of punishing you and me, he punishes his only son. And so here we see sin brings about God's wrath and his judgment. Uh, the second point here is we're going to see is the mercy of God, the mercy of God. So we've seen the wrath of God. Now we're going to see the mercy of God, that God punishes sin, but he also shows mercy to everyone who repents. Look at verse 10. It says, David, David is getting ready for bed. So David, you know, you can kind of picture this in, the, in his royal palace. He's saying goodnight to wife number two, uh, goodnight to concubine number seven. He's trying to get ready for bed. And all of a sudden, in the midst of all that, the Holy Spirit convicts him of sin. That's, the whole, that's one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit, to convict you of sin, to say, hey, you said something you shouldn't have said. You did something you shouldn't have done. And, and in the midst of getting ready for bed, that's what happens to David. And he, he repents. He says, I have sinned greatly. He says, Lord, I've acted foolishly. Take away my iniquity. And so there he is. He's repenting before he goes to bed. You don't have to answer this verbally, but have you ever done that? Have you ever been getting ready to go to bed and the Holy Spirit just convicts you that you shouldn't have said that to a spouse, a sibling, someone in your family, a coworker. You shouldn't have done something that you did. Or maybe it was a sin of omission. You, sh you should have done something. You should have helped that person. You didn't. You should have said that to that person. You didn't. Has that ever happened this month, this week, maybe yeah, last really. night? We, we've all we've all done it. We've all done it, right? And that's what happens to David. He's getting ready for getting ready to go to bed, and he has a prayer of repentance. And then you can picture it. David goes to bed. He's repented. He gets up the next morning, gets on his royal robe, goes in, gets in the kitchen, gets some coffee, and then there's a knock on the door. In the morning, it's the prophet Gad. Gad shows up early, 6 a.m., knocking on his door with a quick response from God to David's prayer. David's prayed. He's gone to bed. He's woken up, and God's man is there. And the prophet Gad says, there's three ways God's going to punish you. We, we talked about that. But I want you to notice to notice God's mercy. Notice how David answers Gad. He says, let me fall into the hands of God than into the hands of man. What he's saying there is, I'd rather have my fate in God's hands, who will show me mercy, than in the hands of men, who will not show me mercy. In a crisis, here's the point, in a crisis, David says, I trust in the mercy of God. In a crisis, I trust in the mercy of God. And there's a clear point for us to be reminded of this morning. We're living in a crisis, um, health crisis, economic crisis. I mean, the country's kind of frozen right now. Do you trust in the mercy of God? Do you trust in the mercy of God in the midst of what we're, we're dealing with, what we're going through, where cities, states, and, and continents are shutting down right now? Uh, thousands are sick. Who do you trust? Do you trust in the mercy of God? Or are you inclined to panic, be anxious, and be worried and be upset and try to figure out how this is all going to work out? So the reminder here is, do you trust this morning in the mercy of God? Do you have faith in his goodness? That God's in control. He'll do what's best. Trust your life. Trust your future this week, next month, in the hands of God. Because David, think about it, David expected, in the midst of this, expected and desired mercy. And depending on when this happened, it may have been because he knew God had already been merciful with him already. Right? Remember Samuel chapter 11? He stole a man's wife, lied about it, killed the guy, tried to cover it up. And God sh could have just taken him out on the spot. God showed him mercy. So maybe this is after that, and David says, I know the mercy of God. I'm a sinner. God's been merciful to me. He'll continue to be merciful to me. I, I trust my future in him. And so do you expect mercy from God? Think about that. Do you expect mercy from God? Or do you, do you think you have to kind of earn it? I mean, if I say enough nice things, and if I do enough nice things, and if I'm a good enough person, then maybe God will be good to me. I do 
my best, and God will recognize that, and things will be good. That's not how it works. God chooses to be merciful to his people when we repent, when we follow him, we trust his son. We don't earn it. We don't take credit for it. Mercy is a gift. It's something that God gives you. It's something that Christ has merited for you, earned for you at the cross, and it is applied and given to you by the ministry of the Holy Spirit not something where you write a check and God gives it to you or you do a hundred good deeds and God gives you a little bit of mercy in, in response to that. It's not how it works. God gives us mercy because what we deserve to be blunt biblically what we deserve is death. The wages Paul says in Romans, the, the payment for your sin, the payment for what you do is death. And that is so countercultural. that goes against American culture, western culture to say we deserve death. Sin deserves death, and sinners deserve death. And that's us, right? And God says, I'm going to be merciful. You deserve that, but I'm going to give you life. I'm going to give you forgiveness of sins. I'm going to give you adoption to my family. I'm going to give you the hope of the resurrection. All those things that we talk about, all the things that we say at the Apostles' Creed. God doesn't give you what you deserve. He, he spares you. He gives you mercy. He doesn't punish you. He gives you all those things. And I think the temptation now is to be sidetracked by what we're dealing with, with this crisis, with this virus, and forget the mercy of God. Forget about that. And I was just reminded even, even last night, Romans 8.32, um, if God is for you, who's, who's going to be against you? If God has given his only son, he's not spared anything, he's given his most valuable person, the Lord Jesus Christ, he's given you what he has. If he's given you that, why are you, why are you worried about COVID-19? <laughs> why is that keeping you up at night? I'm saying that to myself as well as to you. Why is that keeping you up at night? God's in control. If he's for you, who's against you? Don't worry about it. Know the mercy of God in your life. Know that God doesn't give you what you deserve. That's a good thing. And we know that because we look at the cross. We look at the cross and we see that that's where the, the wrath and the mercy of God is demonstrated because Christ takes on the wrath that you and I are deserving of and you are given mercy at the cross because that should have been you. It should have been me at the cross. That's the gospel. The wrath of God, the mercy of God is demonstrated on the hill outside of Jerusalem where the Son of God is executed as a common criminal. That's the gospel. And you see a, kind of an echo of it is in David. David says at the end of what we read this morning, he says, spare the sheep, implying that David is the shepherd. Spare the sheep. They don't deserve to spare them, God. And what does Christ do? Christ, John chapter 10, he is the good shepherd, right? He is the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. He does what David talked about. Christ actually does it. He is the good shepherd who spares his people because he goes to the cross for you. Not so that you can pay him back, but so that you can live for him a life of gratitude to his grace. So this morning, the reminder is, you know, the, the virus crisis is serious, but don't be overwhelmed by it. Don't be overwhelmed by it. Wash your hands. Be safe. Avoid people a little bit. I know we're all sitting kind of far, far apart, which is great. Be smart about it, but trust, trust your life in the Lord's hands. He will do what's best. And reflect on the gospel this week. Reflect on the cross, what God has done for you, that he's given you mercy, that he's given you life. Think about that this week. Um, as I thought about it this week, I thought, you know, in a year, 10 years, 20 years, we will not be talking about coronavirus at all. Well, maybe we might be joking about it, honestly, my own opinion there. Um, but we will be talking about the gospel in a year, in 10 years, in 20 years. We won't be talking about this. This will, will pass. It might be a month. It might be six months. I don't know. You know. But we will be talking about the gospel. So this week, instead of being overwhelmed, anxious, or just bored sitting in your house, reflect on the gospel. Reflect on the wrath of God on sin, that you deserve that. I deserve that. But also reflect on God's mercy. 